to a Dinosaur Adventureland in Lenox, Alabama at Genesis Baptist Church. It is April the 12th, 2024, talking about what was the original creation like. I believe the Bible is literally true and scientifically accurate, and evolution is the dumbest and most dangerous religion, and it's nothing but a religion in the history of the world. What's this Bible say? I believe the Bible from cover to cover. Okay, been a Baptist preacher 50 years, taught high school science and math 15 years, and I want to help to strengthen your faith in God's Word. Okay, old-fashioned, independent, temperamental, fundamental, right-wing, radical, chicken-eating Baptist church. That's us here at Genesis. Today, April the... i got to move the square down. I forgot. Garden of Eden, we started last week. Every Friday, we're redoing what's my seminar, which we put out in 42 languages. Uh, creation seminar, 50 bucks for the whole thing. Guy called me today, brother from Wisconsin. He said, Brother Holman, I make copies of your tapes like crazy and pass them out all over the place. You can copy them all you want, as long as you're not selling them, okay? Please give them away. People get saved watching a video that will never come to church. Anyway, so listen, we've got to move that down. Next uh, Tuesday is the eight-year anniversary of the guy giving us this property, 160 acres, 150, 140 acres. Come on down to Dinosaur Adventureland. We're going to have boot camp coming up this summer. Got a couple of guys uh, working on to get uh, speakers in for Dinosaur Adventureland's boot camp coming up probably July 4th. But you know about Joe from Mexico? He said, man, I can get fireworks real cheap out here in New Mexico. You want me to come for 4th of July? Well, yeah. Who would not want that? Anyway, so plan a 4th of July trip to Dinosaur Adventureland. Okay, help us to open for free. We've been open for eight years now for free. Join our 777 Club. So I like what you're doing, Brother Hovind, trying to reach people. I'll help you give a dollar a day, 31 bucks a month if you can, or a dollar a year. Okay, we don't, I, don't even check, I don't even know who's in the club. I don't know. I don't want to know. <clears throat> but go to drdino.com and uh, no, no super chats on YouTube. Maybe make any checks to CSE if you want to help us. Okay, we're at here's our science center and our church on the right there. Amazing. Awesome job on the floor the guys did here. Now we've got to get a new picture of the stage now. We rearranged it. I used to be there. Now I'm over here. Okay. Anyway, we're straight north of Lenox, straight north of Pensacola, 70 miles, and we're one mile north of Lenox. Good luck finding that one on the map. Let's see, did I have to, you know, all this stuff? We've been covering about the age of the earth in the first uh, 12 sessions, and now we're going to go to, oh, what was the original creation like? Did I get the slide number right? No, hang on one second, folks. Let's see. I got way too many. Oh, I see. Slide number 43. Okay. It's been a busy day. Okay, cut down a big pine tree this morning and worked on a couple other projects. And Yeah, I do want that right here. Uh, Okay, now slide number 24. No? Nope. There. One moment here. The joys of live TV, okay? There. In seminar part two, we talk about what does the Bible say the world was like before the time of Noah and before the flood? Why did they live to be 900? If you look at Genesis chapter 5, it gives all the dates. That's my chart I made here. The people before the flood came lived to be 900 years old. That's what the Bible says. And we talked about that last, last Friday night. And after the flood, something changed, and it dropped off to 400, then 200, then 100. Something changed. We'll talk about that tonight. What was different before the flood? What's the scientific evidence to support the Bible? Hmm? What's historical evidence like? And is God ever going to fix it back like it was in the Garden of Eden? Oh, yeah. Actually, he's going to make a new heaven and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. I want to be there. And how can I be sure I'm going? Well, I, t I tell people, if you'll listen to all the evidence with an open mind, I think someday you'll say, hmm, the Bible's right. God made a perfect world and man wrecked it. That Bible is right. Then about two weeks later, you're going to sit up in bed in the middle of the night and say, oh, no, the Bible's true. This changes everything. Yeah, it does. Okay. We talked last time about how the new Bible versions talk about in Genesis 1.1, they messed it up in, in the seventh word. They used the word heavens, and it should be heaven singular. Okay. Heaven, like King James, it gets it right. One or two more get it right. But most of them have it wrong. Can't even read seven words before you find a difference. Get the books on uh, things that are different or not the same. That's a good one by Mickey Carter, my wife's ex-pastor. David Daniels did a great book on uh, look what's missing. They took the Bible verses they took out. We sell this one too, do we? Anybody know? Bobby, do we sell this one? Look what's missing? No. no? You can get it from Chick Publications, Jack Chick. Good friend of mine, okay? So, in the beginning, God created the heaven. Later, down in verse number five, this was on the first day. Then, verse number six, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the water from the water. So, starting on day two, God divided the heaven singular into three heavens. So, in Genesis 1, 6, God divided the heaven into heavens. So, we got the heaven, 
the first heaven where the birds fly, the second heaven where the stars are, and the third heaven apparently is where God lives. So day one, he made earth, space, and time, and light. Day two, he made the atmosphere. On day one, it was singular heaven. By the time you get to day two, he divided it into heavens, plural. So all these Bible versions have it wrong. It should be heaven, singular. Okay, King James it gets it right. The other ones are wrong, in my humble opinion. Okay. Then we see in the Ten Commandments where God said to remember the Sabbath day because in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is. He claims he made everything in six days. That would include dinosaurs, by the way. Talk about that when we get to video number three about six years from now. Okay. Exodus 31, same thing. He talked about the Sabbath. He said it's a sign between me and the children of Israel. It's a sign between God and who? The children of Israel. All you folks trying to keep the Sabbath today, I'm sorry. You can't do it. First of all, you, you know, I've never met anybody who does it. Okay? Some think they do, and some keep parts of it. Watch my video 7 for more on that. Okay. So what was the original creation like? God said, at the end of time, there would be, knowing this first, thou shall come in the last days, I take that to be like now, scoffers, walking after their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? Since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this, they, meaning the scoffers, willingly are ignorant of. Willingly ignorant. That means they're dumb on purpose, okay? That by the word of God, the heavens, now it's plural, were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. How can the earth be out of the water and in the water? It says in 2 Peter, the scoffers are ignorant of how God made the heavens and how the earth was out of the water and in the water. Let's look at that tonight. What was the original creation like? It says in the next verse, whereby, meaning by the water, the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. So the scoffers are ignorant of the flood also. So back to Genesis. God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it, let the firmament, Divide the waters from the waters. Some people say, well, it must be the dirt. If it divides the water from the water, you know, Atlantic and Pacific, they're separated by the continent. No, no, no. Must be the dirt. It's wrong. Sorry. No. Keep reading. Verse number 20. God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life and fowl, that would be birds, that fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. So the birds fly in the firmament. Well, that would not be the dirt. I'm not aware of any birds that fly in the dirt, are you? I think they all fly in the air, yeah, okay. And boy, they do good at it. You know, most birds fly less than four miles high. That's about their max maximum altitude. A couple of them get up to seven miles high. Whoa. Well, how thick is the Earth's atmosphere? Oh, it depends where, how you want to measure it. Earth's atmosphere, anywhere from six to 6,000 miles. There's air molecules floating around 6,000 miles. But it's about the highest altitude is seven miles a bird can fly. And that's, that's pretty rare. So let there be lights in the firmament. This would be the sun, moon, and stars. And God made two great lights, and he made the stars also. Verse number 14 and 16. So Paul said he was caught up to the third heaven. I think this was referring back to the time when he got rocked to sleep. I was thrown to death, I mean, outside of Lystra. And he was, he was caught up to the third heaven. So the first heaven, Genesis 1, God divided the heaven into heavens, and he made the first heaven where the birds fly. Then he made the second heaven where the stars are, then he made the third heaven where God lives. God, Paul was caught up to the third heaven, he said. Heavens, plural, declare the glory of God. The firmament showeth his handiwork, Psalm 19. So God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. Well, here it tells us, remember back in verse 6, it said he divided the water from the water. Some people say it must be the dirt. No, it's the water above the firmament. That's where the birds fly. There was water above where the birds fly and water under the firmament. That's what it says, okay? We see in Psalm uh, 148, Praise him, ye heaven of heavens, and ye waters that be above the heavens. King David wrote this about 1,000 B.C., or 3,000 years after the creation. Maybe there's still a layer of ice or water above, beyond the stars. Nobody knows where the last star is. And if they could find it, I know what the next question is. What's after that? Okay. <laughs> right. Duh. So there might be another canopy of ice beyond the farthest star. I don't know. I think maybe everything we see is one of those little glass balls on God's dresser. Picks it up once in a while and shakes it. Hey, how you doing in there, folks? Okay. <laughs> Behave. Yeah. 
That's what he's trying to say. Shape up, okay? Uh, for this they willingly are ignorant, how the earth was standing out of the water and in the water. What was the creation like? Well, I believe from all the clues we see in Scripture, there was water above the air, which is now gone. It fell down at the time of the flood, and water under the crust of the earth. We'll talk about that in a minute. So what did they eat before the flood? What's it going to be like when he fixes it back? Hmm. Where did all the water for the flood come from, and where did it go? And were there really giant people on the earth over 10 feet tall? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Giants in the earth. We'll talk about that later. So I believe, <clears throat> I'm a strong believer in what's called the canopy theory, that there used to be a layer of two or three inches of ice above the atmosphere. Now, today our atmosphere, depending on how you measure it, goes out anywhere from six to 6,000 miles. Most people say about 50 miles, okay? If we could put a layer of ice up there and squeeze the air down into maybe 10 miles, all it would do is good things on the planet, make, it, make breathing easier, make flying easier for the birds. Uh, there was a, then there was a layer of air to breathe, the firmament, where the birds fly. Then there was uh, water under the crust of the earth. You know, does water block radiation? All that you need to know. Huh. At 400 nanometers, some of it being part of the visible light spectrum, water absorbs more than 90% of UV rays. Hmm. Interesting. Maybe God put water up there for that reason. Hmm. Light crystallizes ice. Great article in Physics Magazine, physics.apps.org. Uh, sunlight can melt the snowflakes on your driveway, but light can create ice crystals. You can read that article for yourself. Interesting. Much of the water in the universe is probably in the form of amorphous ice, non-crystalline state, where the molecules are randomly oriented, something like a snapshot of liquid water. I think you can read all about amorphous. Anyway, I believe that the God designed the canopy above, which might have been a special type of ice. It would block some of the UV light, block some of the X-rays. Let's see. UV irradiated amorphous ice behaves like a liquid at low temperature. Science Daily had an article about that. UV irradiated amorphous ice behaves like a liquid. Hmm. So the Bible says the earth is the Lord's. He founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. What? God made the earth on top of the water? Yeah. All these verses tie together to tell us there was water in the crust of the earth. He, layeth, he gathereth the waters of the sea together as a heap. He layeth up the depth in storehouses. Anytime you see the word depth in the Bible, it usually means the oceans, the deep, okay? They cast them out into the deep. He stretched out the earth above the waters. So I think the Bible is teaching pretty clearly. There was a layer of water above the atmosphere, probably ice, a couple inches thick, a layer of air to breathe, maybe 10, 15 miles, and then a layer of dirt and rocks to stand on, the crust of the earth, and then water under the crust of the earth. Walt Brown's hydroplate theory is fabulous. The book's at the bottom of my stack, so I won't make have an earthquake here getting into it, but uh, it's a great book in the beginning. In the 600th year of Noah's life, the fountains of the deep were great deep were broken up. The water that used to be inside under the crust came shooting up when the fountains of the deep broke open, and it shot up to the surface. And if you calculate this assumed 10-mile crust of the earth, a cubic foot of rock weighs about 160 pounds, depending on what kind it is. I understand that. So that would put eight and a half million pounds of pressure per square foot. If that water down under the crust is under all that pressure, when they finally do get a crack to escape out of 60,000 PSI, 30 tons per square inch, would squirt up pretty high. Imagine a squirt gun with that kind of pressure behind it. You cut somebody in half, okay? I believe that would be shooting up the water fast enough to launch things probably out of Earth's gravitational pull and launch them into orbit. So some of the particles might have gone up and hit the moon. We covered that the other night. I say, you atheists get upset when I talk about this. You believe the moon and the earth all fit in a dot smaller than an atom. Come on. Okay. It's just a theory that maybe the escape velocity of the earth at 25,000 miles an hour, which decreases with altitude, uh, shot up. And some of the junk shot off the earth hit the moon. And some of it might still be floating around in space. And we run around smack into it once in a while like bugs on a windshield. Maybe that's why the craters on the near side of the moon are different, bigger than the craters on the far side. Because the stuff shot past and was drawn back in, and moon's gravity is weaker than ours, a lot weaker. Okay, let's see. Okay. Anyway, there's the theory. And some of the stuff might have shot up and come back and hit the Earth and made the craters that we see, like Winslow Crater. I was out there at the visitor center in Winslow, Arizona. I was amazed. That, that meteor hit right next to the visitor center, almost hit the visitor center, brother. 
It's a joke, Anna. It's a joke. Okay. Uh, during the flood, water rushed out of the cracks, and the crack, the crust would then sink in. As the water escapes, the crust is going to sink in. Well, that's logical. And rock is heavier than water, pound for a cubic foot for cubic foot. So that's going to concentrate the mass of the earth a little bit, which would speed it up. Hmm. And as the water shoots out of these cracks, it's going to widen them, erode them wider until it runs out of, of water underneath. And that widening the crack allows the basalt underneath to come up. Walt Brown did a great video on that about how the rising basalt would cause the layers of the earth above to slide back. Maybe that's why we have wrinkled mountain ranges, Wrink like wrinkle in your carpet, push it into the wall, it wrinkles up. Lateral compression <coughs> is the best way to explain the folded mountains. I think maybe the crust of the earth slid sideways during the flood, during the fountains of the deep breaking open, causing some of these strange features that we see. Or even at the end of the flood, when the mountains arose, I think the crust was still unstable sliding around. Anyway, so there's still some water trapped under the crust of the earth today. When they went down to the bottom of the ocean, they found hot water vents shooting up into the bottom of the ocean. Well, duh, if there's water shooting up into the bottom of the ocean, where does it have to be coming from? Uh, down lower than that. <laughs> the hunt for Earth's deep hidden oceans. Large amounts of water detected in the mantle. Hmm. They say there are 10 oceans worth of water still in the crust of the Earth. 10 oceans worth. A New Scientist magazine did an article eight years ago. Uh, Jules Verne's idea of an ocean deep beneath the surface and journey to the center of the Earth may not have been far off. Earth's mantle may contain many oceans worth of water, with the deepest 1,000 kilometers down, 600 some miles down. If it wasn't there, we would all be submerged. This implies a bigger reservoir of water on the planet than previously thought, and all that water fit in a dot smaller than an atom. That's the hard part to believe. Matter of fact, I'm not going to believe that. Okay, The water is much deeper than any seen before, a third of the way to the edge of Earth's core. Its presence was indicated by a diamond spat out 90 million years ago by a volcano in Brazil. Oh, the diamond had a date on it. Okay, let's see. The diamond, you can read all about the diamond and the water found in the diamond. Just read the article for yourself. Okay. Deep sea hydrothermal vents. They get down to the bottom of the ocean, and they find hot water squirting up into the bottom. Oceans may have six times as many hydrothermal vents as they thought. There may be millions of these still squirting hot water into the bottom of the ocean. Okay, it doesn't, doesn't affect my theory at all. I believe it's true. As the crust sank in, it would trap pockets of water. And as the crust sinks in, it's going to contract the mass because the water would come to the top and the crust would be heavier. And so the earth would speed up a little bit, like an ice skater when they pull their arms in, when they're spinning, or a diver if they tuck tighter, they spin faster. Maybe that's why most of the ancient calendars have 360 days in a year. And the earth sped up a little bit because of Noah's flood. It's been slowing down since then for other reasons. But the crust of the earth contracting would speed the earth up. And now we have 365.2422, which is why you have a leap year every four years, but you don't have a leap year on the century mark. Who cares? You've studied it. Okay. So other ancient calendars. Calendars all over the world call for 360 days per year. 800 BC, 360 days. Romans used a 360-day calendar. Ancient Egyptians used a 360-day calendar. Anyway, so the crust of the earth would sink in. A layer of water above, or ice, would do some amazing things. It would block some of the UV light and uh, some of the X-rays and gamma rays and beta rays and all them ray boys. Most of them are pretty harmful to your carcass. It would block some of them. Water vapor surrounds planets. European scientists using ultra-cold ultra -cold orbiting telescopes have discovered unimaginable volumes of water in the space between the stars. They were astonished, astonished to find water vapor in the freezing atmospheres of Jupiter, Uranus, Neptune, and Saturn, and Titan. Well, maybe some of the water got shot off the Earth. I don't know, it's just a theory. Water in the space between the stars. In Job 38, God said, uh, God said to Job, Where were you, where wast thou, when I laid the foundations of the Earth, when the morning stars sang together? Do the stars produce not just light, but radio frequencies? Oh, yeah. Dr. Baugh has a great article on that. He's a good friend of mine. He thinks that canopy of ice above would be, act like a crystal radio and transform the radio waves into music. And they would hear the music of the stars inside that canopy. Some people think even the, the zodiac is now a perversion of the original uh, 
plan that God had to have the gospel in the stars. I don't know. But maybe they were. You start with Virgo the Virgin and you end with Leo the Lion. That'd be cool. Get to hear that. Okay. God said, said God covered himself with light as with a garment. Nobody knows what light is. We can deflect it, refract it, refract it, you know, bend it, uh, speed it up, slow it down, but nobody knows what it is. So it says in Psalm 104, he covered himself with light. And then it says, he laid the foundation, the, laid the beams of his chambers in the waters. He maketh the clouds his chariot. Verse 5, who laid the foundations of the earth that it should not be removed forever. Thou coverest it with the deep as with a garment. The water stood above the mountains. This is talking about the flood. At thy rebuke, they fled. What would the they be? Uh, the water. At the voice of thy thunder, they hasted away. They go up by the mountains. They go down by the valleys. So when the crust of the earth was flexing around at the end of the flood, mountain ranges would come up. The water would rush off into the hole, the low place. Thou set a bound. They may not pass over. We call that the beach. Mm -hmm. I think the earth cracked up, like it's still cracked up today, and some of the mountain ranges lifted up at the end of the flood. And it's interesting, all the mountain ranges follow the coastlines, nearly all of them. Rocky Mountains, whoop, right over here, follow the North, North Pacific. Appalachian Mountains follow the North Atlantic. Alps, I mean, the Andes Mountains follow the South Pacific. Even the Alps follow the Mediterranean. I think a small place caved in right there, tilted in, Alps came up, water rushed off. Just a theory. Okay, think about it. Anyway, the Bible says God remembered Noah. And the waters assuaged. The word assuage means to drop down. They, the water just dropped down. Well, if the crust of the earth settled in and someplace else popped up, this becomes mountain. Yeah, the crust, it, the waters assuaged at the end of the flood. Then it says, the waters returned from off the earth continually. This is written 600 or 400 years ago, King James Bible. It's, it, they translated the phrase halak bashab, which means going and returning. The waters returned from off the earth continually. The water would, Noah would look out, water's running away. Look out the next day, water's coming back. Look out the next day, it's running off again. If the crust of the earth sank in, the water would rush down to fill in the hole and then slosh back and forth for a while. He didn't get out of the ark for five more months until God told him to. Wasn't quite safe yet. Halak vashub. Maybe that's why we have horizontal sediment layers laid down during the flood. Then they folded up and lifted up while the layers were still bent, or still soft. Then the water rushed back and forth, sloshing back and forth as it, the energy gets dissipated, and it would wipe it off and deposit new layers on top. Hmm. Maybe that's why we have what's called an unconformity in geology. Why are these layers like that? Of course, the evolutionists say, oh, it took millions and millions of years. No, it might have all happened in a few months at the end of the flood. The ark rested in the seventh month, but Noah didn't get out till the 13th month. Why do you wait five more months? Uh, the water's still sloshing back and forth, and it's still muddy outside, and there's nothing to eat out there. So the Bible says in the 600th year of Noah's life, the second month, the 17th day of the month, he went into the ark, and the fountains of the deep broke open. He, went, he had gone in 17, seven days before that, and God shut the door. Then it says, um, the waters dried up from off the earth, and Noah removed the covering of the ark, and behold, the face of the ground was dry in the second month on the 27th day. So he went in on the second month on the 17th day of his life. Now he gets out on the second month. On the, so he's in there for a year and 10 days in the ark. Then finally God said, go out of the ark. It's interesting. King James Bible has it right. God said to Noah, come into the ark. Wait, wait, wait. For God to say, come into the ark, where does God have to be in order for that to make sense? He's in the ark. He's going with you, Noah. A lot of new Bible versions say, Noah, go into the ark. Oh, man, no, no, no. Stick with the King James, okay? Come into the ark and go forth out of the ark. So he was in the ark on February, we'll call it February the second month, February 10th of his year 600, okay? Then the rain started and the fountains of the deep broke open seven days later. The ark hits bottom five months later. Then the tops of the mountains are seen. Then he takes the cover off the ark. God says, go forth. So he's in the ark for a year and 17 days. Year and, yeah, year and 17 days. I said year and 10 days. Okay. So why did he stay in for seven more months or five more months? Well, the water wasn't gone yet. It was still going and returning, and the ground was still muddy, and there was nothing to eat, nothing to build homes with. So he stayed in, and plus God hadn't told him to go out. 
So the waters decreased continually until the month, tenth month. In the tenth month, the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains were seen. Noah released a dove, but the dove couldn't find any place to rest, so it came back. Then he released it again, and it came back with an olive branch. Third time he released it, it didn't come back. Now, stuff out there to eat and safe to get out. Dove couldn't find rest because the ark had moved away from the mountains. Or the plates were flexing and the mountains were submerged again. Mountain ranges might have come up and then gone back down during the time of the flood. Parts of the world might have only been covered for a couple of weeks. The fact that Noah's in the ark for a year and 17 days does not mean the earth is flooded. The whole earth is flooded for a year and 17 days. How long does it take to drown somebody? A couple of minutes, yeah, okay. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. Well, today's atmosphere, we break it up into seven layers, the troposphere, mesosphere, thermosphere, exosphere, ionosphere. There used to be, I think, a seventh layer, a layer of ice. At about six miles up right now, and again at about 50 miles up, it's 100 below zero. I remember flying to Australia and flying to Alaska and some of these long flights. The planes get way up there, and they got a little television screen so you can watch it for six hours while you fly. And it tells the outside temperature. It's chilly up there, minus 100. Yeah, real, real chilly. This crystalline canopy with super cold ice would be about 10 miles above the Earth, I'm guessing. That would take all the air that now stretches out for who knows how, depends on the moon pulling our air up, the tidal. The moon makes a tide of the air also. But the canopy of ice above would block some of the radio waves, block some of the UV light, and increase the air pressure. It might have been held up, this ice could have been held up by like an inflatable building, just simple air pressure. Could have been held up, there's some big inflatable buildings, could have been held up by the Earth's magnetic field. Cubic foot of ice weighs about 62 pounds. Lay, inch layer would weigh about five pounds per square foot. So it could have been just in air pressure holding it. And so plus ice canopy could be held up by what's called the Meissner effect. Super cold ice is magnetic and will float on top of another magnet. The fact that ice is diamagnetic can be demonstrated by hanging an icicle from a very thin string and then bring a strong magnet near one end. The icicle will twist away from the magnet. Yep, ice is magnetic. Who would have thunk it? There's a magnetic hoverboard, okay? Concentrator effect. Study all that for yourself. But Physics World did an article. Magnetic charge ice slides into view. New material, magnetic charge ice, created by physicists. Hmm. Scientists create magnetic charged ice, Argonne Laboratory. Let's see. Uh, that permits an unprecedented degree of control over local magnetic fields and could pave the way for new computing technologies. Development of magnetic charge ice is published May 20th issue of journal Science. Okay. Wikipedia, spin ice. Yet the magnetic moments in the temperature range between 0 0.05 Kelvin, that's real chilly, almost absolute zero, and two degrees Kelvin, where the spin ice phenomena manifest themselves. That's another interesting article. Okay, read that for yourself. Can a permanent magnet become too cold to function? Cooling permanent magnets make them, makes them stronger magnets. And outer space is real chilly, so this canopy of ice above the atmosphere would have been in contact with outer space, if you can call that contact, contact with nothing. But it would be cold and stay super cold and, super, and become magnetic. Ice cloud, well, we can cover all this another time. If you read the book of Josephus there on my shelf, it says uh, he was an ancient historian. He said that God set the heaven above the universe surrounding it with ice. The Jewish uh, scholars have always said there was a crystalline canopy around the world. He placed a crystalline firmament around it. The thickness was three fingers, this guy said. This guy said the thickness was two fingers. And I've always said they probably split the church. Jews like to argue about everything. But they'd argue about was it two fingers or three fingers. I don't know. I don't care. Quit arguing about it. Doesn't matter. Okay. Flattened, there was ice above the atmosphere. On the second day, God brought forth the creations. The firmament, not the same as the heavens of the first day, it's the crystal stretched forth over the heads. Hmm. He made it to crystallize into a solid. And this crystal and canopy would act like an Eskimo's igloo. They can build an igloo, build a house out of ice blocks. And outside it can be 40 below zero. And inside it's 61 degrees. Under an ice, yeah. Altitude versus temperature. I've gone too long tonight. I'm sorry. I've got too much to cover here, and I'm talking as fast as I can go. So we'll get into more of this next Friday. What was the original creation like? I believe there was a crystalline canopy above the world, and that blocked out UV light and increased air pressure. 
and increased oxygen concentration. We have our amber samples from the museum here. Come see our science center. Amber is petrified or hardened tree sap. When you break a tree, you know the sap oozes out. If it hardens, it'll trap the atmosphere that's around it. Around it, the air bubbles found in amber are 50% more oxygen than today. I think the world before the flood, and these are probably from trees, trees being cracked apart during the flood. Uh, amber. Remember, Jurassic Park had they got the mosquito blood out of amber. We well, can get air bubbles out of amber. We'll cover that next time. Okay, a couple of questions, real quick, brother. We got to go. That's long enough. Could you do a video on the flat earth canopy theory? Oh, the, I, the, they're two different things, okay? The canopy above is, I think, a legitimate theory. The flat earth is not. Only Kansas is flat. The rest of it's round. So, no connection. Can you speak seriously about Acts 238, released from Matthew? If you're talking about baptism saves, um, if baptism was part of salvation, it should be mentioned every place salvation is mentioned. It's not. If I said, get in the car, sit down, buckle up, we're going to the store. And you get in, and you don't sit down, and you don't buckle up. Well, we're still going to the store. Okay? So I think salvation is only by grace through faith. The thief on the cross, obviously, could not get baptized. So if that's what it's about, then I should give a long... i got other dragons to fight, okay? There's people that already fight that one. Can't the science gent layeth the smack down? Yay. Is that good to lay a smack down? Okay, I guess it's good. Yay. My college biology books promote evolution, and all can be destroyed with the simple truth gate. Praise God. Dave, tell, tell your teachers to come debate me. I'll debate them any time. Let's see. Don't you think that meteors would have demolished such a canopy? Well, were there meteors around before the canopy collapsed? Or are the meteors junk flying around since the flood destroyed the world? How do you know there were meteors before that time? I don't think you could prove that. Okay? Uh, I always thought that 360 in a circle was based on the Earth's orbit. Well, I don't know why they chose 360 degrees as a circle. Uh, maybe, maybe it is tied back to 360 days. You would think teaching geometry, I would know that. <clears throat> I probably did it one time, but I forgot more things than I can remember. Whew. That's good, though. Did I tell you about the three signs of a genius? I did. Yeah, three signs of a genius. One's a poor memory. I forgot the other two. Okay. Why 360 degrees in a circle? I don't know. Works out great. Okay, any more? Last one. Pray. Very soon, job opening. Been waiting eight years. Well, Denise, if you've been waiting eight years for a job, why wait for a job? Start your own company. Do something. Why you wait for somebody else to hire you? They started the company. Why don't you start one? Lawn mowing, babysitting, do something. I, I, you ought to start four or five. You ought to have four or five sources of income. Or own a piece of property you can rent out. Have a service you can do, like you know, washing some washing cars, cleaning gutters, cutting grass. Don't wait for somebody else to hire you. Go start your own company. Do something. All right. Thank you so much. We'll see you next time, <coughs> Friday night. <coughs> Get into more. Patrick Urish, the genius on nutrition and health that took over Bill Sardi's ministry, is coming Sunday afternoon. Be here for a week. We're going to have him on the program soon. Is there a debate this week? Oh, Donnie. Yeah. Okay.